hey guys in this video the fantastic mr t is going to be taking you through everything you need for your aqa gcse citizenship paper one now this is quite a long video so you can jump in you can jump out a really good idea is to leave yourself a little time stamp down in the comments down below so that you can come back to the area that you left off before don't try and do this video all at once because it is quite long now to go with this video over my website there is the free revision checklist which you can download and as you're watching the video you can sit there with the checklist and take off the bits that you do know and identify the areas that you're not so sure about. Also waiting for you over my website for immediate download there is the workbook. So you can try questions on areas that you're not too sure about, hopefully improve your knowledge, look at what sort of things the examiners are looking for, and then try and improve your grades in the exams. There are many opportunities for citizens to participate in democracy, such as voting, elections and referendums, membership of political parties, joining interest groups, pressure groups and protest groups, the use of social media and petitions, and the magistracy and civil courts. There are also barriers to the effective participation of citizens in democracy, such as age, many things require you to be 18 or over, time and money limitations. Being a member of a political party, an interest group or a pressure group can require a subscription, which may not be affordable, and extensive time involvement, which may not be practical. Apathy and indifference, not knowing or not caring what is happening, misinformation and fake or biased news. Joining an interest group can have advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are that you can get involved with a cause that you believe in, you can meet like-minded and sympathetic friends who share your values, and you can further a cause and help to do good in your community. The disadvantages are the echo chamber phenomenon, where large amounts of people in a group who all agree just reinforce each other's views without ever challenging them. You can open yourself up to online trolling and abuse, and time and money commitments are required. There are also advantages and disadvantages to joining a political party. The advantages are that there is potential progression or a career. You can influence policy and individuals, and you can support a philosophy or individual that you agree with. The disadvantages are the cost. Joining a political party requires a donation or subscription. The effort and time required, especially if you're involved in campaigning, and the potential alienation that you may feel from friends or family. Similarly, standing as a candidate for election has advantages and disadvantages. The advantages are the raised profile and status, and the ability to influence the debate and get your voice heard. The disadvantages are the time, effort and money commitment, and the opening of yourself up for abuse and ridicule. Interest groups and pressure groups have several roles. They campaign for or against a particular cause or policy. They represent a specific group of people, and they raise awareness of a problem or issue. Examples include Stonewall, who campaign for LGBTQ plus rights, Extinction Rebellion, who campaign on behalf of the environment and against climate change, Leave.eu, who campaigned and continue to campaign for Britain's exit from the European Union, Fathers for Justice, who campaign for the rights of estranged fathers, Britain First, an English nationalist association, and Caged, who campaign for the rights of retired greyhounds. Trade unions also have several roles. They represent employees in the workplace at things like tribunals and formal meetings. They campaign for employee rights within the industry. They organize and vote on the appropriateness of industrial action, such as strikes, and they provide advice and guidance to their members. Examples include Unison, the PCS, which is the Union for the Civil Service, the CWU, the Communication Workers Union, and the National Union of Students. Charities and volunteer groups also have several roles. They take practical action to relieve a problem. They provide care, people, or services. They run not-for-profit shops and cafes, and they campaign and fundraise around a particular issue. Examples include the RSPCA, the RNLI, MIND, a mental health charity, Save the Children, and Christian Aid. 
And so we can look at examples of how citizens can work together to resolve particular issues. Extinction Rebellion is an example of citizens working together to raise awareness of an issue through protest and civil disobedience. The RSPCA is an example of citizens working together to take practical action to identify, rescue and rehome animals in distress or maltreatment. The Royal British Legion is an example of citizens working together to fundraise, in this case for military veterans. And Stonewall is an example of individuals working together to campaign for the rights of a particular group. The media can also be used to bring about change through the use of social media, where you can use campaigns, events and memes to make a point or put forward an opinion. Traditional radio or TV reaches a larger and generally older audience. Newspapers and magazines reach a wide and targeted audience. And traditional press releases and events can generate headlines and potentially controversy, which can influence the news agenda. There are many ways in which citizens can become involved in the legal system. As a juror, where they may decide on the innocence or guilt of defendants. As a witness, where they may give evidence or testimony in civil or criminal cases. As a victim, where they can report crimes to the police and give evidence. As a magistrate, where they may decide on the guilt in minor cases or carry out routine legal processes, such as the awarding of bar licenses. As a special constable, where they assist the regular police as backup where needed, or as a police and crime commissioner. As an elected party political member of the public, who when elected sets the priorities for local police. During your study of GTC citizenship, you will have looked at undertaking a practical investigation. And this is the process you should have followed. Firstly, the forming of a reasonable question. Secondly, the forming of a hypothesis based on that question. Thirdly, the planning of a method to carry out your investigation. Fourthly, the carrying out of research on the question that you have formed. Fifthly, analyzing the data and results you have collected. And lastly, evaluating the research as a whole. There are several types of source we encounter when doing research. Primary sources come direct from the source. Secondary sources are written about a subject or after events. Textual sources are things like speeches, articles and books. Statistical sources are data and numbers. Examples include the following. A primary textual source might be a speech by a politician. A secondary textual source might be articles and books written after an election about that election. Primary statistical data would be direct from the source, such as government census data. Secondary statistical would be analysis of opinion polls in a newspaper. So what makes a source reliable? Reliable sources should be free from bias. They should use limited or no emotional or emotive language. They should be factual and evidence-based. You should expect to see listed references and sources for their information. There should be clear authorship and it should be clear where the funding has come from. And they should not be publicly editable, like Wikipedia, for example. Examples of sources are the following. Wikipedia, which is an unreliable source, as it is publicly editable. The BBC, which is considered to be reliable, as it has clear funding, no bias, and is factual. Census data is also reliable, as it is factual, without bias, has clear sources, and funding. The Office for National Statistics is also reliable. It's factual, it's not biased, and it has clear sources and funding. Social media is an unreliable source. Authors and funding are unclear, and it is publicly editable. Tabloid newspapers are also unreliable. They use emotive language and are biased. So what is the difference between a hypothesis and a theory? A hypothesis is an idea yet to be proven or disproven by investigation or evidence. A theory is an explanation supported by the majority of evidence available. When formulating a research question, you should consider the following. Is it feasible? Can it actually be answered? Is it reasonable? Is the research to do it actually possible? Is it biased? Is it an inherently biased question? Is it new or has this research been done many times before? And is it relevant? Is there a purpose to the research? So let's look at some good and bad research questions. Good ones include the following. 
did turnout generally increase or decrease from 1970 to 2019? That's a very much feasible, reasonable research question. Did Theresa May generally focus on Brexit during her speeches made as Prime Minister? Is there a link between weather conditions and turnout during 20th century general elections? To what extent did John Major refer to crime and punishment during speeches made as Prime Minister? Examples of bad research questions include the following. Did household income influence voting behaviour during elections in the 1920s? Data for that is unlikely to be available. Did the anti-Semitism of Jeremy Corbyn lose him the 2019 election? That's an inherently biased question. And how does Boris Johnson react to the use of Italian slang during interviews? That's a question with questionable relevance. When evaluating your research, these are useful points to consider. Did you prove or disprove your hypothesis? Could your research be repeated? Could your sample size be larger? Were there problems with your process or method? Could you draw conclusions from your research? And what further research could be done on the back of yours? So let's look at the concept of democracy. Demos means people. So democracy is government by the people. In the UK, we have a representative democracy. In some other countries, they have a more direct democracy, such as Switzerland, where many affairs are dealt with using referendums. In some other countries, they also have a presidential democracy, such as the United States. There are several core principles that underpin democracy. These are human, individual, and civil rights. Responsibilities the rule of law and equality. Human, individual and civil rights include things like the right to vote, the right to free speech and the right to religious freedom. Responsibilities involve the responsibility to follow the laws. The rule of law is the idea that the law comes above all else. And equality is the idea that each individual is inherently equal. Governments and cabinets have several powers they make policy decisions and set the general direction of government. They write, propose and attempt to pass legislation through Parliament. They handle relations between the United Kingdom and other countries and they represent the United Kingdom on the world stage. They also run individual government departments and handle events and crises as they crop up. The Prime Minister also has several additional powers. They appoint cabinet and government ministers, about 90 in total. They set policy and legislation direction for the government. They set overall direction and policy for the government. They set the tone of what the government is doing. They negotiate and confer with other leaders. They lead their particular political party. They respond, as the whole government does, to crises and events as they occur. And they can grant honours and pardons. Parliament also has several roles. MPs vote on the passing of legislation. They also amend and update legislation and also look at it more thoroughly in select committees. Individual MPs also represent their constituencies and they generally hold the government to account. The civil service is much overlooked but also has several roles. They carry out routine administration and day-to-day -day matters such as the processing of passport applications. They enact the decisions and policies made by ministers and they advise ministers based on their long experience. The monarch also has several roles, being a figurehead for the country, meeting weekly with the prime minister and acting as an experienced advisor who has seen a great deal of events in the 20th century. The judiciary, by which we mean lawyers, solicitors and judges, also have several roles. They interpret the laws passed by Parliament. They decide on liability in civil cases and sentencing in criminal cases. They interpret complex legal issues, especially in the Supreme Court, and judges set precedent by their decisions. Later judges will look at the decisions of earlier judges when weighing up a case. When looking at the British Constitution, it's important to remember that the UK has an uncodified or unwritten constitution. Other countries, such as the United States, have a written constitution. 
There are several sources for our constitution. The first is the relationships between different institutions, how parliament, the cabinet, the prime minister and the judiciary interact with each other. Existing law, also known as precedent, legislation passed by parliament, and tradition and history, known as common law. Local government has several roles. They are elected in local elections and deal with smaller issues in a specific local area, such as waste collection, roads, parking, social housing. Local government is funded both from central government grants and also through council tax. Devolved governments also have several roles. They rule over a constituent nation of the United Kingdom, examples such as the Scottish Parliament, the Northern Ireland Assembly and the Welsh Assembly. They're elected by individuals in those nations, and they have powers over most matters in that area, education, healthcare, crime and punishment. But some issues are reserved for the Westminster government, mostly foreign affairs and defence. So who can stand for election in the UK? Well, they must be over 18 years of age, a British, Irish or Commonwealth citizen. They must either be nominated by a party or be an independent candidate. They must not be in a disqualifying profession, such as a judge, police officer or bishop, where they may have a conflict of interest between their profession and their responsibilities as an elected individual. And they may not be otherwise disqualified, such as by bankruptcy or criminal record. So how are candidates to be an MP selected? Only one candidate per party can stand in each constituency. Larger parties generally carry out interviews to select a candidate, as there may be competition in each constituency. Existing MPs traditionally get to stand for their party by default. The candidate receiving most votes in each constituency becomes that constituency's Member of Parliament, but those receiving under 5% of the vote lose their £500 deposit paid to the Electoral Commission. So who can vote in elections? You must be 18 to vote, a British, Irish or Commonwealth citizen. You must be registered to vote, a process which takes about three minutes. You must be resident at a UK address or be living abroad with British citizenship. And you cannot have been legally excluded from voting, for example, by committing a serious criminal offence or electoral fraud. A key question in this unit is should we reduce the voting age to 16? There are arguments for and against. Arguments for include that young people are affected by elections. They pay some taxes and it would encourage young people to be more interested and involved in politics and current affairs. Arguments against include the following. There are many things which cannot be done at 16. Young people have less life experience and do not always have the maturity to make an informed decision when voting. Voter turnout is the number of people who do vote in a constituency compared to all of those who can. To take an example, in the Skipton and Ripon constituency at the 2019 general election, 58,724 people of a possible 78,718 voted. This is a turnout of 74.6%, which is quite high. Many factors affect turnout, such as the weather, turnout tends to be lower if the day is terrible, the date of the election, turnout is generally slightly lower in winter, whether there are big issues on the day, such as Brexit, voter apathy and levels of disengagement with politics, the average age of the electorate in a constituency, older people tend to be more likely to vote, and how close the election is. In a close election where it could go either way, turnout tends to be higher. Taxes are raised and spent in several ways. Taxes are raised through national insurance, income tax, VAT, corporation tax. Collectively, these are known as general taxation. Fines and penalties, such as speeding tickets and court fines, raise revenue for the government. And sales, such as passport applications and driving license applications. They're spent in many ways. The largest part of government spending is social security and welfare, which takes roughly a third, followed by health, education, defence, interest payments, public order and safety, and then others, such as the environment and transport, which collectively get to 24%.
There are two traditional views on taxation and spending. The traditional right-wing view is that taxes and spending should both be low. People should keep more of their wages, but public services should be more limited and people should be more self-reliant. The traditional left-wing view is that taxes and spending should both be higher. People should contribute more, but public services should be better funded and more should be provided by the government. In Britain, we use the first-past-the-post electoral system, where the United Kingdom is divided into 650 constituencies. Each of these has roughly 80,000 people. Each of these elects a single MP. Some of these are very small, such as inner-city constituencies, but some cover huge areas, where population density is low, such as the Highlands of Scotland. There are things to consider when evaluating this system. It does tend to result in strong and stable governments, it's simple and relatively easy to understand, and each member of parliament is linked to their constituents. But there are disadvantages. Smaller parties are greatly disadvantaged. Elections can be won by way less than 50% of the vote. Millions of votes may be irrelevant. If you're a Labour voter in a safe, conservative constituency, your vote counts for little. And elections are decided by a small number of swing constituencies, known as marginals. There are several alternatives to first past the post. In proportional representation, the percentage of the votes equals your percentage of the seats. In the alternative vote system, each person chooses a primary and secondary choice. The votes are then distributed accordingly. In the list system, candidates are ranked and votes are then distributed on the basis of these ranks. There are three parts of government. The executive, the prime minister and the cabinet, which takes action, sets priorities and sets direction. The legislature, which is parliament, which votes on, amends and scrutinizes legislation. And the judiciary, the courts, which interprets law, passes judgments and sets precedent. Parliament is composed of two houses, making it bicameral. The lower house is the elected house of commons and the upper house is the appointed house of lords. The house of commons debates, constructs, and votes on legislation. The house of lords reviews and amends this legislation as necessary. The conservative party is a party of the right wing. Its traditional color is blue, and it's been in government through most of the latter half of the 20th century. Traditionally, it's been the party of the more well-off, business, the self-employed, and agriculture. The Liberal Democrats is usually regarded as a party of the centre. Its traditional colour is orange. It was in coalition government from 2010 to 2015 and has traditionally been the party of students, teachers, academics and the higher educated. The Labour Party is traditionally a party of the left wing, using the colour red, in government through parts of the latter half of the 20th century and has traditionally been thought of as the party of workers, the working class, trade unions, and the lower paid. There are numerous other smaller parties, such as the Green Party, focused on the environment and tolerance, UKIP and the Brexit Party, both focused on the exit of the United Kingdom from the European Union, the SNP, or Scottish National Party, focused on Scottish interests and independence, and Plaid Cymru, focused on Welsh interests. There are several key people within the House of Commons, the Speaker and several Deputy Speakers, who manage debates and votes and ensure the rules are followed. The Black Rod, responsible for security within Parliament. Whips, who are tasked with ensuring members of Parliament vote as their party wishes them to. And the Front Benches, members of whom speak for their party on specific issues. Governments are usually formed by whoever can command a majority in Parliament. Normally, this is the leader of the largest party. If they have more MPs than all of the other parties combined, this is an overall majority. If not, they can form a minority or coalition government. In considering how other countries govern themselves, we need to look at both democratic and non-democratic states. Examples of democratic states include representative democracies, such as India, Australia or Iceland. Direct democracies, such as Switzerland. 
presidential democracies, such as the United States or France, and federal democracies, such as Germany or Brazil. Non-democratic states include theocracies, religious government, such as Iran or Yemen, single-party communist states, such as China or Cuba, absolute monarchies, such as Saudi Arabia or Brunei, and traditional dictatorships, such as current Russia or Turkmenistan. 